Okay, today we are continuing our series on the gospel. We're talking about the gospel in many different ways. And today I want to consider this uh, passage here in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24, and talk about moralism. Moralism is the largest religion in the world today, and it always has been. There's always people who are proud of their nationality. They're proud of their religious beliefs. They're proud of their knowledge, their, their correctness. And we're going to see what Paul has to say to people like this. I, I will have to admit that most of my life I lived as a moralist, but I've come to know Christ and I no longer rely on my morality, my supposed uh, theological correctness. And so we're going to look at this for a few minutes today. And um, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and read the passage here. Now you, Paul says, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So that's our text today. And if you want to see it on YouTube, we'll publish it uh, here. I plan to publish it here in a few moments. But uh, when I'm through, but it will be under home church and moralism and Romans chapter 2, 17 through 24. And then you'll have today's date. And um, here's the last one we published on the gospel. And you can and the one before that. And uh, then uh, even the ones before that. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can always stop. And if you want to look and see. Um, what the name of another one was, you can go back and, and check that one. But I, I, w when I teach these sermons on the gospel, the good news, I hope you'll watch them during the week. In fact, uh, I wish you'd do it every day because you're going to pick up some things, I think, as you listen to the gospel over and over again that you might have missed the first time through. And also, this is a good way of learning when you hear the gospel over and over again. And I also hope that you'll share these because the gospel is God's power to save. And if you share this um, with people you think, well, they wouldn't be interested. Uh, well, let God determine. Let the Holy Spirit work and let's see what happens, because I think you, you might be surprised how the Holy Spirit works in your life and in others. I certainly have been many, many times. I think if you surrender to God, you might as well. All right, so we go to this passage in Romans chapter 2, verses uh, 17 through 24. And it's going to set up what I want to talk about next week, God willing, in verses 25 through 29, the last verses, the verses right after this, and um, where Paul talks about outward religious observances. Very, very important. And he's setting that up with these verses that we're going to talk about for a few moments today. But I want you to look at the context. When you look at the book of Romans, what you're going to see is that Paul gives his theme for the entire book in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Some people include verse 16 as well, 16 and 17. But Paul is going to say, that's my theme right there. It's the good news, the gospel. That's what it is. That's my message. That's why I'm writing the book of Romans, to tell you about the gospel. And then immediately in the next verse, verse 18, for three chapters, clear to chapter 3, verse 20, 
Paul is going to just explode into talking about the bad news. This is terrible news. Let me tell you the worst news you can ever imagine. I'm going to talk to you about the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is coming upon every single person. And you think, wow, what's that have to do with the gospel? Well, until people understand uh, where where they stand in God before God, they're never going to appreciate the good news of the gospel. They're ne they're never going to think it's good news. When you realize your true condition and how terrible it is, then you're going to appreciate good news. But but if you don't think you're that bad of a person, you're not going to think, well, that's good news at all. I'm a pretty good guy. So Paul has to, first of all, slay this idea that you might have that you're, you're okay. And uh, one of the ways he does it is by talking about moralism. But let's look at this whole section real quickly, because right in the middle of this section, Paul's going to talk about moralism. And next week, he's going to talk about how that people rely on outward religious um, observances. And they think that these things can make them right with God. So I want to talk about this uh, today. So let's look at this context. This is all about the wrath of God. After he states his theme, this is what I'm going to be talking about. He starts off, he launches into this section uh, about uh, the wrath of God. And um, he says, uh, for example, let me read from um, Romans chapter 1. I'll read a few verses here because I don't think I put them on a PowerPoint. Um, so in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then he start, He just goes into this wickedness. And he says, this wrath that God has, this just wrath, is, not will be, it will be as well. But it is right now, he says, being revealed against all this wickedness, this, un, this godlessness and wickedness of people. And then he, I'm not going to read the whole section, but he says in this, God gives them over to these sins, a lot of these sins. People want to commit. God says, okay, I'll let you have them. And you, you're going to see that the end is, is not good, even in this life. But he ends this section by saying this in verse 29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And so we have this very damning uh, section by Paul in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Right after he says, I'm going to tell you good news, he tells us about the wrath of God, tells us of all these terrible sins that people are committing. And um, he's primarily speaking to people who, if you want to, originally when he wrote this, to people who were not Jews. He's describing people who were not Jews, not religious, you might say at all. And we know of many people in the world who are just like this, who commit all these sins that Paul describes in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. But then in the very next verse, in chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through this chapter that we're studying today, he says anybody, basically, if you think that your morality exempts you somehow uh, from condemnation, uh, you're really wrong. You are very deceived. And so he's going to, in this section, uh, talk to people who think they're 
They're better than those people that he described in chapter one. And again, I didn't put it in a in a, um, a PowerPoint, but let me read you the very next verse. He says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. You see, you, you can point your finger at those people in chapter 1, 18 through 32, committing all these horrible sins. They are sins. And the wrath of God is being revealed against them right now. But he said, guess what? If you try to point your finger at them, you're you're condemning yourself. When I was a kid, they, we, they used to say, I don't know if they still say it. When you point your finger at somebody else, four fingers are pointing back at you. In other words, be careful of who you you know, criticize because, you know, you should be criticizing yourself even more than that. But he says, uh, you, you who pass judgment, he says, you're doing the same thing in chapter two, verse one, right after this section. So in other words, any self, uh, self-righteous person, man or woman, who is moral, they think they're moral, they're moralist, they think they're somehow exempt from all these sins that he's described in chapter one, the end of chapter one. They think they're okay. That's who Paul's addressing. If you think your morality exempts you from condemnation, you are you are deceived. And so um, Paul's going to end this whole section from chapter 118 to chapter 320 in a very lengthy conclusion. His conclusion is verses 9 through 20. And I, I say that his conclusion, you know, he's got two conclusions, really. Chap, uh, verses 9 through 18, and then verses 19 and 20 are kind of a conclusion to his conclusion, because this is a lengthy conclusion. But I'll just read part of what he says in his conclusion. He says, what shall we conclude then? You see, it's a conclusion. Uh, do we have any advantage? Those of us who are religious, not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and non-Jews, Gentiles are non-Jews, anyone who's not a Jew, alike are all under the power of sin. So everybody alike, all are under the power of sin. You can't, you can't separate yourself from those people in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And as he said, um, you're condemning yourself. We're all alike. He said, and then he goes on to quote a bunch of scriptures. I'm just going to mention two verses full here. There is no one righteous. That's what it's written in the Old Testament. Not even one. Paul's going to say when he starts the good news, he, he's going to say it again. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. They've all turned away. They've together become worthless. There is no one who got, does good, not even one. How many times in there is he saying all and no one and <laughs> no good? I mean, no one understands. He wants us to get it, doesn't he? He wants us to see that we're all in the same boat. That's my conclusion. And so now, when he gets to chapter 3, verse 21, only then does he start telling the good news about Jesus Christ. But he's had to establish this fact that everybody is under sin. Everybody is under the wrath of God. Everybody. That, you know what that means? That means you and me, everybody is under the wrath of God as sinners. And he even states it again here when he starts talking about, as I said, the good news. He's going to say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what Paul is doing is he's addressing any person who thinks their morality exempts them from condemnation, the condemnation of chapters, chapter one, that latter part of chapter one. He's talking to the moralist. He's describing the person in our verses 17 through 24. He's describing the person who thinks that um, 
he's not that bad of a person. Um, he's describing people who who are religiously active. That's what we'll talk about next week. Because a lot of people, they observe these outward religious observances. They're very religiously active. And they think, well, I'm okay with God. I go to church three times a week. I even sometimes read a verse, you know, the verse that pops up on my phone every day. I, I mean, I'm a religious person. Well, he's going to address that next week, outward religious observances and people who rely on them to be saved. And he's going to say, no, you're in the same, you're all in the same boat. Every We've concluded everybody alike is under sin. But in these verses today, he wants to show us that uh, your moralism won't save you. Just because you, you think you know more or whatever, it won't save you. So let's look at some of the things that he says. He says, uh, uh, of course, we, we pointed this verse out in chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. You're pointing four fingers back at yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. And so after those terrible sins he, he committed that people commit out in the world all around us, he says, you're no better. And so from, from that verse on, chapter 2, verse 1 on, through the section we're studying now, he wants us to know, listen, I'm talking to religious people now. So if you're a religious person listening to this right now, he's talking to you. And uh, here's what he says about these people. These moralists, that one of their problems is they rely on their morality. That's the problem. Your morality won't save you. Here, here he says they had pride in knowing God's law and they bragged about their relationship with God. And does that remind you of anybody today? Whether you're speaking of Hindus or Muslims or Jews or people who claim to be Christian, does it does it remind you of anybody? They they have pride in oh we know God, and we brag about hey we've got a relationship with God nobody else does only us. Does that remind you of anybody? Well, that's who Paul's talking to right here, and he says uh, in verse eighteen. They know his will and approve of what is superior. They actually know it real well. He's speaking primarily to Jews, but he's talking to anybody who's got this attitude of moralism where they think their morality somehow exempts them from condemnation and makes them better in God's eyes than anybody else. And they're instructed in the law. They've gone to theological schools. They get it, man. They, they understand it. He says in verse 19, they've mastered the law of God so well that they can even teach it to other people. Those people don't get God's word. They're blind spiritually. I can tell them what this means. They can even teach it, you see. So is Paul teaching there's anything wrong with being a Jew or a religious person? No. Is he, is he saying in these verses that um, there's anything wrong with knowing his, God's law and internalizing it? No. Is he saying there's anything wrong with making correct ethical decisions be, because of God's law? No, not at all. He's not condemning that. Is he saying it's wrong to share God's law with other people? No. He's not saying any of those things are wrong. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was this. They were relying on it. They were relying on their knowledge of God's law. They were relying on the fact that I can make a correct ethical decision out here in the world because I know God's law. They were making their, their uh, what is moral into a a system of salvation because I know God's word better and I have a relationship with God. I'm saved. That's a system of salvation. Now, God's law, he's going to, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, he says, it's holy and it's good and it's righteous. God's law is not the problem. 
the content of God's law is great and it's holy, righteous, and good. But using God's law as a way to uh, have eternal life, Paul said it only brings death. That's the problem right there. People think they know God's law and knowing it and being able to teach it and, and being better at keeping it than other people outwardly somehow is going to save them. They've made it into a system of salvation. And that's what Paul is condemning here. You see, uh, there's not much difference between morality and moralism. But there's an eternal world of difference between making a good thing, morality, into your God, moralism. People are making moralism their God and think that that moralism can save them. Now, moralism is extremely common, and it always has been. It's the largest religion in the world, and it always has been. It's the religion of people who compare themselves with other people, and they look around and notice they don't get it. You know, they're not going to the right church. They're not doing church right. They don't get, you know, the ethical teachings of God correctly like I do. We're the only people who have a relationship with God. And God, if he, you know, God can see, man, I'm, I'm better than these people. I mean, I was born into this Jewish religion or Church of Christ or whatever you want to say. I, I was born into it, and I get it, and our religion's the true religion, and, and God can see that, and he can see that we're the saved ones and nobody else is. That's moralism. Now, moralism fails because we're all in, inconsistent in our behavior. There, there's not a single person who lives up to their own standards, much less the perfect standards of God. There's not You have never lived up to your own standards. No one has. But let me tell you something. You're not going to be judged by your standards, your low standards. When you die, you're going to be judged by perfect standards, the perfect standards of God, his law. That's what's going to judge you. And you don't even, he, he's pointing out in verse 21, he said, guess what? You don't even live up to your own standards. Um, I don't know if I, I had those verses up there. I don't. But in verse 21, he says, uh, um, for example, God's moral law, Everybody that he is, everybody has inwardly, everybody has this. God created us to where we know that it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to commit adultery, it's wrong to lie. We know these things because God put that within us when we were born. Everybody knows that. Any culture, anywhere, they all know that these things are sin. And so he says, so Paul gives some examples. He says, uh, you know, God's law teaches us that it's wrong to steal. And, and what do moralists do? They point their finger at somebody who broke in somebody's house and stole their computer or whatever. Ah, look at them. That, that's a sin. Well, yeah, it's a sin. You're right. But a moralist, you know, doesn't look in the mirror and see, hey, you know what? When I'm lazy at work, I'm stealing from my employee. I'm getting paid and I'm not doing anything. You see, uh, a moralist doesn't see that they're stealing in different ways. I could point out when I teach the Ten Commandments, I show all the ways that these commandments apply. Uh, not all the ways, but many, many where they apply to us. But a moralist will point their finger to everybody else. Look at them. They stole money out of that person's pocket. Okay, but you steal too, you see. Or um, the moral law of God teaches don't commit adultery. It's a serious sin to commit adultery. But you know what the moralist doesn't realize is every one of us has committed adultery. 
There's not a single person who's ever lived who hasn't committed adultery against God. That's what James says in James chapter 4, verse 4. He said, when you are friends with the world, he said, you've committed adultery against God. And so a lot of people, you know, they'll point their finger at somebody who's committed adultery. It's a serious sin. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. It's extremely serious. But guess what? Every one of us has committed adultery too and against God. And, and so, you see, we can condemn, for example, hypocrisy. A moralist condemns hypocrisy. Well, hypocrisy should be condemned. We condemn our government leaders for hypocrisy. We condemn our, our employers for hypocrisy. We condemn, we condemn church leaders for hypocrisy. All of them are condemned uh, at times because they're uh, hypocrites. But, you know, the church many times ignores sins like gossip. Did you notice in chapter one there? I, I read the end of chapter one. That was one that he mentioned was gossip. And you see gossip in these churches all the time, and church leaders ignore it. It's a sin. It's an egregious sin. Oh, we'll condemn hypocrisy in government, but we won't. what about the hypocrisy in our churches when there's gossip going on? Or gluttony, another sin that's condemned there in Romans. Or greed. Well, don't tell me that Americans aren't guilty of greed. You see what I'm saying? Moralists point their finger at everybody else. You're, you guys are all wrong. And they've got a lot of sins. That's what Paul is teaching in this passage. Moralists point their fingers, that he says, at everybody else, and yet they're committing the same things. What he wants to show, what he is demonstrating in this passage is that moralism, people who rely on their morals to be saved and make that a system of salvation, I'm better than everybody else because look at me, I'm more moral. That's a misplaced confidence. You're, you have a false sense, Paul says, of security. That's why he ends chapter 3 there in his conclusion. There's no one good. No one is, understands. They've all sinned. All have fallen short. I mean, he says it over and over again. That's why he does. Because there's no your moralism doesn't give you an advantage over anybody else. You haven't even lived up to your own standards. And so... What Paul, why does Paul write, say all this, by the way? He wants everybody to know that it's not just people who are committing outward sins. And by the way, there are a lot of attitude sins too at the end of chapter one. But it's religious people who think they're better than someone because of their morality. They too are lost. Everybody's in the same boat. And so our passage next week, God willing, will be in the last four or five verses, verses 25 through 29, where Paul says a lot of people also rely on their outward religious uh, observances and think they're better because they're doing church right, you see. But here he just wants people to see that uh, you can't be saved because you think you're, you're uh, morally superior. All right, let's make some applications before we conclude. Probably everybody. And before I was saved by grace, I used to preach, you know, uh, in, in a works church. And I used to say this all the time, too. Man, why didn't the Jews get it? I mean, Jesus performed miracles and they didn't get it. And Paul is making these points. Why can't you Jews get the point? You're not, you're a sinner too, and you need Christ. Man, why can't those Jews get it? But you know, what if I showed you that, um, you know, people today can't get the point either? You and me, 
many times. We read the Bible again and we point our finger at those Jews. Man, Paul, he, this is a strong point Paul was making against those Jews. But what about you? What about me? You see, the very same thing can be said about us probably at different times in our lives. And um, we can see how the Jews didn't get it. But whenever we see some serious teaching of God's word applies to us, well, we might be proud of our religious upbringing. Uh, we, we might be proud of the fact that um, we have the true interpretation of the Bible. We might believe that our external observances, religious observances are correct. And, um, but we can't see the fact that we're sinning against the very law of God that we're boasting in any more than the Jews. And we can't see the fact many times that, hey, we're not getting it right either. Somehow, we don't get it at all, just like the Jews. And so the point of this sermon and this text right here is uh, to see that this doesn't just apply to Jews. It applies to religious people who think they're moral. Um, it, could, it could just as easily be said uh, and, and applied to Catholics, to Muslims, what he says here to Jews to Hindus, to Baptists, to Lutherans, to the Assembly of God, to Presbyterians, or to Church of Christ, could just as well be stated to them too. And um, so you can see this teaching is very serious. We need Christ. Our moralism, this is this is the lesson that you must, of course, he doesn't state it here. He's going to talk about the good news beginning in chapter 321. But you must understand, your moralism won't save you. You might think you're better than someone else. You know, I, I know people say, well, I've never been arrested and those people of a criminal record, well, I don't give a hoot, neither does Christ. But I'll tell you what I do care about. Have you come to know Christ? Because I don't care about your past, neither does Christ. If you're, you're, you're either saved by grace or you're lost. And if you're saved by grace, I don't give a hoot what your past is. It's gone. You don't, have, you don't bear that guilt anymore. You don't have to live with that guilt either. But I'm telling you something. If you've not been saved by the grace of God, by what Christ has done for you and Christ alone, not you, not your moralism, but Christ and Christ alone, you're lost. I don't care if you think you are morally better than some people out there who have done some horrible things that are definitely wrong. You're in the same boat as them. I've given this illustration many times in my preaching uh, through the decades, but uh, let's suppose that salvation was jumping across the Grand Canyon. Now, I don't know how far it is across the Grand Canyon, but it's a long ways. I don't know, maybe several miles. I don't know. But it's a long ways down. And if you fall off the cliff in the Grand Canyon, you're going to die. Okay. But to be saved, every single one of us, we have to jump across the Grand Canyon. Well, none of us can do that. Do you know what the world record is for the long jump? 30 feet. 30 feet. But to be saved, the whole world has to run up to the edge there and jump, I don't know, several miles to be saved. And then we can go to heaven. And so there's going to be some really good athletes that jump about 30 feet out there. And guess what? They're going to go down. They're going to die. And then there's going to be people who can jump 20 feet, and then they're going to die. And then there's people who can jump 10 feet. And maybe I can jump five feet out there, and then I'm going to die. And there might be some people get right on the edge, and they just fall down 
and right from the edge they don't eat, they scrape the edge all the way down and they die now i want to ask you something is that person that jumped 30 feet out there that great athlete best athlete in the world maybe jump the farthest out there is he any better off than me who jumped five feet no we're both going to die am i he can't turn around and say to me hey i'm i jumped farther out than you did I'm going to say, so what? We're both going to be dead in about two or three seconds. And I'm not going to turn around to the guy that's just scraping the edge over there, get right to the edge and fall down and say, I jumped five times farther than you did. He's going to say the same thing to me. So what? We're both going to be dead in about three or four seconds. You see, you can't save yourself and you can, you can be a moralist and you can brag about I'm better than all these other people. They've got criminal records. They've been divorced. They've got, okay, so what? You're, you're both lost. And you can't save yourself. You don't have the ability to do it. So you can brag all you want to that you're better than, than someone who can only jump five feet out there to save themselves like me. You can brag all I six times farther than you, Jimmy. Okay, brag all you want to. But you're lost. And that's what moralists are doing. They're turning around and pointing their finger at all these people who they, they look at and say, man, I'm a lot better. If there's a God, and there is, I believe in him, and I've got a relationship with him, you think. Just like the Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims, everybody else. And they can see that I'm, I'm a lot better than those people. And what Paul is trying to teach someone like you, if you believe that, is you're lost. No one understands, and you don't get it. There's no one righteous, not even one, and that includes you. And so that means we need help. <laughs> I mean, to be saved, you got to jump across the Grand Canyon, and we can't even get close. The best be 30 feet out there. We Boy, we're in terrible condition. We need some help, don't we? And the only one who can do that for us is Christ. He jumped across. You see, he lived a sinless life, and he gives it to us when we put our trust in him alone to save us. And so that's the only way that you can be saved. All right. Well, next week, God willing, we're going to talk about religious observances because some people don't just rely on their moralism to save them. That's their religion. I'm better than everybody. Look at people around me. But they rely on their outward religious observances to save them. And um, I grew up in a religion like the Jews. They did. They, really, they relied, Paul says, on your moralism and on your outward religious observances. I grew up in a religion that believed, put their confidence. I did my moralism I was better than everybody else you know my church I look at all these sinners out in the United States of America look at them and outward religious observances we did church right and so next week God willing we're going to talk about that that won't save you either that's what that's Paul's point that's not going to save you either all right, so may God bless you, and may you learn the lessons, and may you come to know Christ, because that's why Paul's giving us this message. He's wanting you to know you, you have a problem. You need help. You can't save yourself. Now, what are you going to do about it? Well, you can't do anything about it, but guess what? There's someone who can. Put your faith and trust in him alone to save you what he did, how he lived, not you. And you can be saved. God makes that promise. May God bless you.